The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Rationale, Evidence, and Practical Potential for BTK Inhibitors in Patient-Centered MS Care, Where We Stand Now. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TCY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome. Good evening, everyone, both those who are present and those who are with us virtually. Welcome to this independent industry-supported satellite symposium titled Rationale, Evidence, and Practical Potential for BTK Inhibitors in Patient-Centered MS Care, where we stand now. With me this evening, and my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Reich from the NIH, and myself, Amit Bar-Or, from the University of Pennsylvania. We'll start with the initial presentation, which um, speaks to the topic of why would one develop BTK inhibition as uh, MS therapeutic approach. And so the objectives for me are, for the most part, to set Dr. Reich up for his presentation of the clinical trial data, and really with two main objectives. One is a brief overview of some of the evolving framework of MS immune pathophysiology, really a very brief version highlighting the relevance of multiple different cell types interacting with one another, both in the periphery and in the CNS, and some of the cell types of relevance are identified there, and describing the rationale for BTK targeting with BTK inhibition as a therapeutic approach in multiple sclerosis. And so I think many of you have seen this type of cartoon. We have had an evolution of our thinking about MS and about what controls the capacity of cells of the immune system to traffic to and participate in injury within the central nervous system. And at least part of what regulates these CNS-directed antigen-specific cellular responses relates to the balance that is struck between effector and regulatory T cells, between the T cells and myeloid cells that are known to interact bidirectionally, and then in terms of B cells, more recently the appreciation that while the traditional view would have held they are relatively passive and waiting to receive help from T cells to turn into antibody producing cells. And of course, antibodies have long since been implicated abnormally in the context of MS. What we've learned is that B cells, like myeloid cells and T cells, come in different response flavors, if you like. And these, in part, can be uh, captured based on the profile of cytokines they produce, pro versus anti inflammatory, but other properties of functionally distinct B cells that are relevant for their capacity to participate in the regulation of autoimmunity and to have, in fact, bidirectional interactions both with T cells and with myeloid cells. And so that is the simplified framework that we think is relevant, certainly for immune interactions in the periphery involved in relapses and at least some interactions of immune cells that are then uh, present as part of CNS compartmentalized inflammation and likely immune cells interacting with brain cells, including the immune cells of the CNS, if you like, the microglial cells, uh, are likely to be relevant for these considerations. And you can think in the context of this paradigm where certain therapies might target these cascades of interactions. You can remove cells from the system, for instance, with anti-CD20, which, as you know, targets B cells quite broadly in the circulation and some T cell subsets. And you can think of BTK inhibition, as we'll get into in somewhat more detail here, known to target both B cells and myeloid cells and offering the prospect of targeting these cells not just in the periphery but also within the central nervous system. B cells in the central nervous system and myeloid cells, both the infiltrating myeloid cells that are known to be relevant for MS lesions, but also potentially the CNS resident microglial cells. And so to expand a little bit on the rationale uh, of BTK inhibition and set the stage for the next sequence of slides, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll be thinking of B cells, as shown on the left, and myeloid cells, illustrated here as the CNS microglia on the right. And as far as B cells are concerned, BTK, in, in the orange color within the cell, is downstream of the B cell receptor, so that inhibiting BTK will inhibit B cell receptor-mediated activation of the B cells, resulting in decreased maturation of the cells, decreased proliferation, decreased autoantibody production, and decreased cytokine secretion. Myeloid cells, as we'll talk in a little more detail subsequently, have several different pathways by which uh, BTK may mediate its effects 
and on different cellular responses. But the one highlighted here is the capacity for BTK to receive signals through immune complex activation of the myeloid cells, which would be through the FC receptor on their surface. And when that is inhibited through the inhibition of BTK, one would expect to see decreased microglial activation and decreased production, particularly of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as those listed uh, there. Protein kinase biology is of interest in this context. Kinases, protein kinases are enzymes. So they catalyze the phosphorylation of proteins. And in doing so, they alter the protein characteristics in ways that are relevant for a variety of cellular functions. And in fact, uh, the kinase signaling pathways are identified as the most common form of modulating the responses post-translationally, which means that if you have a gene and it's transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein, the presence of that protein and the function it may subserve can be modulated post-translationally by these protein kinase enzymes. And shown on the right is a protein that through the protein kinase activity and in an energy utilizing context is then turned into a phosphorylated protein with different functional properties. And the Bruton tyrosine kinase family, uh, originally described in the context of um, a condition known as XLA or a primary immunodeficiency that is X-linked A-gamma globulinemia by the pediatrician Ogden Bruton in the 1950s, and hence the name. Uh, this is a condition in which the BTK is mutated and individuals end up as an inherited uh, condition that is characterized by recurrent bacterial infections because of lack of B-cell development in the bone marrow. And these individuals are quite severely immune compromised with very low numbers of B-cells in the circulation and decreased immunoglobulin production. A very, very different profile from someone who is developing normally in terms of BTK biology and then uh, may have inhibition of BTK in a mature immune system. BTK and B cell activation, uh, BTK is shown in yellow in that very busy slide on the left-hand side, and just once again, the inhibition of BTK will influence the capacity of cells to serve as antigen-presenting cells, to proliferate, to differentiate and produce cytokines, as well as antibody production. And the small molecule inhibitors of the BTK have been used in cancer for over five years now, approved in the cancer context, and there is a uh, fair degree of data in the cancer world in terms of the tolerability of these um, uh, oral small molecule inhibitors that have generally been very well tolerated also in the cancer context. Um, the newer generation of BTKs that you'll be hearing about seem to have an improved profile from the original ones. BTK is not just relevant in cancer, it is relevant in autoimmunity, and shown here on the left, uh, the, the bigger cell uh, is the B cell. It sees its autoantigen through the B cell receptor, and again, BTK is relevant to the downstream signaling, and that may influence the capacity of this B cell, particularly if it's an autoreactive B cell in the context of disease, to mediate its pathologic effects of either activating T cells through cytokines or producing autoantibodies, as well as interacting with the cell in the lower right, which is a myeloid cell which itself also expresses BTK. So inhibiting BTK is expected to target both B cells and myeloid cells both directly and indirectly through the action on uh, the B cells. In myeloid cells, as I had mentioned earlier, there are probably multiple pathways that involve BTK signaling. And things that can trigger activation of BTK in myeloid cell include toll-like receptors, or TLRs, as well as the mechanism I had mentioned, which is FCR-mediated antibody or immune complex phagocytosis. The results of the BTK activation, again, tend to be pro-inflammatory responses of the myeloid cells and phenotypic changes that are in keeping with that uh, shift in response profile, which, again, the inhibition of BTK would limit. And this is a very simplified cartoon, sort of a... Uh, basically showing a, a duality of pro versus anti-inflammatory myeloid cells. We know that it is much more complicated, and in fact, this picture here shows myeloid cell lineage uh, and multiple different functions driven by constellations of molecules that you can see are involved in multiple different processes of myeloid cell biology, uh, and that one would expect, and there's still more to learn, about how BTK inhibition may be impacting these different cellular functions. Importantly, BTK itself is part of a family of proteins known as the TEC protein family. These have multiple domains, as illustrated, and the BTK and the TEC family are shown at the top. And so there will be domains that may be shared within and across members of the same family, but also across families. And that raises the question uh, about the relative selectivity of any given BTK inhibitor. And this 
is a slide that summarizes some of the characteristics or the variables that uh, one can use to characterize a BTK inhibitor that may turn out to have an impact uh, on their function. That includes in the upper right the selectivity I had mentioned, but also the particular domain target, whether a BTK inhibitor is reversible or non-reversible in function, and whether it uh, mediates its action through covalent or non-covalent interactions. So hopefully this brief overview has provided some sense of what we're trying to target in terms of the pathophysiology of MS and the cellular interactions and rationale for BTK inhibition as a therapeutic approach in multiple sclerosis. And I will pass the baton here to Dr. Reich to speak to uh, examining the evidence, the clinical trial data. Danny, please. Thanks. So good evening. Um, it falls uh, to me um, to describe uh, the, the, the relatively little data that we have so far about uh, BTK uh, in MS clinically. Um, and I should say it's um, a great privilege to share the stage with uh, my friend, Dr. Barrower. Um, so thank you for setting that up. Um, so uh, these are the um, uh, molecules that are currently um, in the clinic. Uh, that are BTK inhibitors that are in the clinic for multiple sclerosis. Um, as, you, uh, as you probably all know, BTK inhibitors have been in the clinic for a long time now um, with uh, primarily oncologic indications in lymphoma, um, starting with ibrutinib and later acalabrutinib, um, but it's these more selective BTK inhibitors that are being developed uh, in the context of multiple sclerosis. Um, and uh, you can see here, um, evabrutinib, Talabrutinib and fenabrutinib are all currently in phase three testing. Um, we'll get back to talking uh, a little bit about, uh, uh, more about the first two and, and, and less about fenabrutinib, um, uh, which did not actually have a phase two study prior to the phase three, uh, no phase two in, in MS. Um, but evobrutinib and talabrutinib did. Um, Arelabrutinib is a relative uh, newcomer, newcomer, is currently in phase two uh, testing for MS and BIIB091 is um, uh, in, in phase one, and I'm not actually sure of the uh, current status of that, that trial. Um, you can see that uh, they come in, in, in two flavors in terms of, their, of how they bind, covalent and non-covalent, um, and uh, irreversible and reversible uh, inhibitors. This is the study design for the uh, evobrutinib phase two um, trial that was done and published in the New England Journal in, in 2019. This was a 24-week study in relapsing um, multiple sclerosis. Um, patients either had diagnosed relapsing remitting MS or uh, progressive MS with relapses. Um, it was a dose-finding study uh, with a placebo arm, um, three dose levels of evobrutinib, 25 QD, 75 QD, and then 75 BID, and an active uh, comparator, um, uh, which was dimethyl fumarate, which was sort of used to kind of um, tether the results, but not, not a direct comparison uh, in the primary outcome. Um, so after the blinded 24-week uh, period, there was uh, an extension still blinded um, for another 24 weeks, um, a safety follow-up, uh, and then uh, an open-label extension where uh, those who wish to continue could go on 75 milligrams uh, a day. Um, you can see there were numerous uh, outcomes every four weeks, uh, including MRI scans at weeks 12, 16, 20, and 24, which was the primary outcome. And the primary outcome, as is typical for phase 2B studies in multiple sclerosis, was related to MRI, the number of gadolinium-enhancing lesions, which we know are new, uh, newly formed uh, white matter lesions in MS. The, the um, sort of radiological basis of, of relapse, and it's well known um, that uh, gadolinium-enhancing lesions on MRI are highly predictive of effects on relapse in the larger phase three studies. This is a fairly standard uh, design. Um, also measured were the number of new lesions, uh, the volume of the gadolinium-enhanced uh, lesions, as well as clinical endpoints, although the study was not powered uh, to look at clinical endpoints. Um, and these are the results. Um, you can see that 
Uh, this is, again, the um, number of gadolinium-enhancing lesions uh, on the various dose levels, placebo 25 milligrams, 75 QD, and 75 BID. You can see that there were, was reduction of the number of gadolinium-enhancing lesions on the two 75 milligrams, 75 and, and 150 per day. Um, so uh, evidence of, um, uh, of a dose response, although no difference uh, um, uh, clearly between the 75 and uh, uh, daily and the 75 BID dosing. Um, the dimethyl fumarate arm uh, was, was highly active and, and that was um, related, uh, I think, to some uh, one or, or two very active patients uh, that you have such a high number there. Um, there was a trend toward reduction in the annualized relapse. So the study met its primary outcome and there was a trend toward reduction in the annualized relapse rate, again, not powered, um, but it was uh, a trend seen in patients on ivibrutinib. Um, and then as far as the adverse events, which are also another very important um, uh, um, uh, readout in these earlier trials, um, including grade three and serious um, adverse events were comparable um, between the 25 and 75 milligram doses, um, but there was evidence of some uh, liver transaminase um, uh, elevations that were asymptomatic in the twice daily dose. Um, and again, uh, the, um, the trial uh, met its primary outcome. Um, the, again, there was a, a, a 24-week uh, blinded um, extension of this trial, and you can see that the, um, uh, the annualized relapse rates uh, were consistent at the end of 40, 48 weeks uh, to what they were at the end of 24 weeks. So, so this is a uh, uh, appears to be a durable effect um, of the uh, BTK inhibition. Um, and you'll see later that uh, similar extensions uh, results have been seen with tolibrutinib. Um, with respect to tolerability, um, about 10% uh, uh, of the patients uh, did not complete the trial. Um, the uh, rates of uh, various um, uh, adverse events were similar between uh, ivibrutinib and, and, and dimethyl fumarate, except for flushing, which is a, a known side effect, of course, of dimethyl fumarate. Um, and there were some elevations in uh, liver function, but generally um, the, uh, the, the drug was well tolerated in this study. Um, the 108 week uh, safety uh, and efficacy data from the, uh, from the open label extension now um, were presented at the CMSC meeting um, earlier in, uh, sorry, late in 2021. Um, and again, uh, uh, durable effect sizes were shown um, with no new safety concerns or increase in infections uh, that were emergent. Um, and, uh, and persistent decrease excuse me, in, in, uh, in gadolinium-enhancing lesions and, and relapse rate. Um, so, uh, as I said, this, um, this drug, ivobrutinib, is now in phase three studies in relaxing MS. There are two trials um, that are uh, nearly, or I think maybe completely identical um, in their design. They're studying um, fairly uh, um, uh, typical relapsing remitting populations, ages 18 to 55, um, patients have to have had at least one relapse in the two years prior to screening um, or one within one year um, uh, prior to randomization or they could have shown some MRI activity in the prior six months. They have to have had have an EDSS less than six um, and, uh, if, uh, and less than two if they are relatively recent uh, onset in, in MS. And the primary, these are 96 weeks, week trials. The primary endpoint is now clinical, the analyzed relapse rate at 96 weeks, with secondary endpoints related to disability, progression, MRI outcomes, similar to in the phase two, uh, newer enlarging lesions, and uh, some uh, disability scores, as well as, of course, adverse events. Um, these trials uh, were fully recruited um, as of uh, last summer um, and will read out uh, their 96-week um, uh, primary outcomes are expected to read out in um, mid to late 2023. So we should have data uh, by the end of 2023, I think, um, related to the efficacy uh, of, of ibobrutinib in the clinic. There'll be a long-term extension after that, uh, which is expected to go through 2026 um, at, at this point. Talibrutinib um, is uh, the second molecule to go into phase two. 
um, it went, uh, underwent a, um, a rather unconventional but interesting um, phase 2B study design, which was designed to be very, very efficient and to minimize the exposure of patients to placebo. So you can see um, there were uh, two cohorts, um, each of which had four dose levels of talibrutinib, 5, 15, 30, or 60 milligrams per day in one of the two cohorts. Uh, there was a four-week placebo run-in, and that was used, again, to anchor um, and compare against with respect to the primary outcome, which was also gadolinium-enhancing lesions. The other cohort started directly on the drug, and then there was a four-week wa washout at the end, um, and MRI scans were performed every four weeks. Again, these are not um, uh, um, powered for clinical outcomes. Um, it was a relapsing population, um, uh, EDSS under six, um, and there had to be either clinical or MRI evidence of, um, uh, of disease activity. Um, and this is the primary outcome, uh, which was published last year from this trial. Um, the primary outcome was actually a, a measure of dose response, um, so in, uh, increasing efficacy um, on the primary outcome of gadolinium, new gadolinium-enhancing lesions at week 12 on therapy. Um, between 5, 15, 30, and 60 milligrams. Um, it met its primary outcome with a p-value of 0.0178. The, re the reduction in new gadolinium-enhancing lesions relative to the four-week placebo run-in was 85%. Um, and the key secondary endpoint of n number of newer enlarging T2 lesions, also a dose response, um, was also significant with a 90% uh, reduction, so consistent with the gadolinium uh, results. So the second trial to show that BTK, um, presumably for the reasons Dr. Barrower uh, enumerated, could be effective in multiple sclerosis. Um, a, an additional analysis was done to look at the uh, patients with highly active disease. Um, would this potentially be a, um, an approach that could uh, be used in patients who are quite active on MRI? Um, and so about half of the 130 uh, patients who were in this trial met the criteria, uh, which were one relapse in the year prior to screening and uh, evidence on MRI of a new lesion within six months prior to screening, or um, they could have had at least nine uh, T2 lesions at baseline, which means that they're making lots of, having lots of inflammatory attacks in the brain or more than, or two or more relapses in the year prior. Um, and you can see it's about half of the patients across the dosing arms um, uh, of talibrutinib. Um, and the results in this group were, were strikingly similar to the results in all patients. Um, so even in the highly active um, uh, patients, um, there was uh, a substantial reduction in the number of new gadolinium-enhancing lesions uh, with talibrutinib. Um, tolerability was good. Um, almost every patient completed the trial, 129 out of 130. Um, and uh, so very few drug discontinuations. Um, headache uh, was seen, um, and there was uh, mild um, uh, and transient um, liver function uh, increases with very few, um, uh, no, no, no seriously concerning adverse events. There was a serious adverse event, which was in fact an MS relapse in this trial. Um, that required hospitalization, hence it was a serious uh, adverse event. Um, the year one safety and efficacy results from the extension study, so this study after the 16 weeks of the initial was uh, extended. Um, it's a complicated trial design, the phase 2B, so the extension, there were variable periods off uh, treatment and uh, at lower doses, but eventually patients went up to the 60 milligram dose uh, per day, which is the dose that's being used in the phase 3 trials. Uh, and these patients continue to be follow, follow, uh, followed uh, today, and I'll show you some results. Um, uh, the overall results say that there have been um, uh, continued good tolerability and, and, and continued uh, evidence of efficacy. Um, these are the year one MRI outcomes from the extension study. Um, uh, the mean MRI lesion activity remained low, so similar to the, uh, to the, to the 60 milligram uh, dose in the initial phase 2B study, um, 0.4 per patient. Uh, the mean number of relapses remained low, 0.17 per patient, and EDS uh, S scores have remained stable. Um, and then the 18-month um, uh, or 72-week safety and efficacy outcomes were reported in a poster here yesterday. 94% of patients um, are, uh, are still on drug, 
at 18 months, um, the uh, relapse rate at, uh, is 0.17, and 85% of patients have remained free of relapse over that period with EDSS uh, remaining stable. Uh, and again, no new safety si signals have, em have emerged in that study. Um, because of the potential effect of um, BTK inhibitors on uh, C the, 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 the um, uh, pen uh, penetration through the blood-brain barrier and their effect on brain resonant cells, uh, in particular microglia, um, the trials of BTK inhibitors are building in uh, outcomes that are um, intended to try to show or to try to assess whether or not um, uh, uh, there might be effects on brain cells. And these include neurofilament light chains, which uh, can go up as axons uh, die, um, studies using PET, um, positron emission tomography um, that are sensitive to microglia, um, in, uh, uh, brain atrophy studies sensitive to atrophy, um, slowly evolving or expanding lesions. These are lesions in the brain that are getting larger over time through um, uh, various complicated data analysis um, approaches to MRI. Uh, and then paramagnetic rim lesions, which you may have heard about at this meeting, which indicate the presence of chronic um, non-resolving inflammation within the white matter. Um, uh, and we know that microglia and, in fact, um, B cells and plasmoblasts are, and their crosstalk are highly involved in those lesions. Um, so these are all ongoing. Here, again, is a summary of, of those various mechanisms. Uh, on the left, you can sort of see in the, in the white matter um, uh, lymphocytes entering and, 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 uh, engage, and macrophage entering and, and microglia that engage with resonant CNS cells, including, um, uh, including glial cells as well as axons. Um, on the right, uh, the um, meningeal inflammation that uh, is, um, uh, seems to be strongly related to the uh, formation of, of cortical demyelinating lesions, and particularly subpeel cortical demyelination, and these are aggregates of B cells, um, macrophage T cells, uh, that may also in principle be impacted uh, by BTK. Well, not the T cells directly, but certainly cells that they talk to. Um, and uh, so uh, these uh, various imaging me measures are being assessed um, in, in the various trials that I described and in their long-term extensions. Um, and uh, I'll just show you briefly the data. Um, this is the Everbrutinib data that were uh, reported at the Ectrams meeting uh, in 2021. Um, and here you can see at 24 and 48 weeks, uh, there is the suggestion of um, uh, a smaller volume of lesions that are slowly expanding on the higher doses um, of, uh, of ivobrutinib. Again, these are exploratory outcomes um, related to that trial. Um, so um, uh, um, not negative, um, not yet strongly positive. These uh, studies generally uh, probably require um, many, many patients, uh, such as in the phase three trials, to get strong readouts. Um, the talabrutinib data uh, were presented at this meeting, um, and, and these are just n numbers that are reported in terms of the volume of the slowly expanding lesions uh, across the dose, doses, dosage arms, what they initially started at and what they uh, eventually they, they ended up on 60 milligrams. Um, you can see the numbers here, but we uh, did not attach a p-value to these uh, at this time. Um, and then with respect to the paramagnetic rim lesions the, that identify chronic active uh, non-resolving white matter inflammation, um, they have generally been stable over time in this population. One patient had a, uh, P, a PRL, a paramagnetic rim lesion, that disappeared uh, by week 72. Two patients had new paramagnetic rim lesions. Um, these were patients who were active on trial. Um, uh, and, and we know that chronic active lesions form in the wake of uh, new uh, gadolinium-enhancing lesions. Um, and so uh, I will just close with a summary again of the phase three clinical trials that are, are underway. Two studies of ivabrutinib uh, with the teraflunamide comparator in relapsing MS, um, which, as I said, we should have primary outcome data by end of 2023. Um, talabrutinib. Uh, two studies with teraflunamide as a comparator um, uh, where the uh, primary outcome is event-driven rather than a fixed time period, so um, are likely to have a readout uh, somewhat earlier, uh, perhaps even in, uh, toward the end of this year. Um, 
two studies of talibrutinib in non-relapsing uh, multiple sclerosis uh, versus placebo, so Hercules uh, in secondary progressive MS without relapses and Perseus in uh, primary progressive MS. These will take longer to read out. And then fenibrutinib, uh, which had been studied in the context of lymphoma as well as various other autoimmune, non-CNS autoimmune diseases, um, uh, is now in f t three phase three uh, trials for MS, two in relapsing MS, uh, with a teraflunamide comparator, um, with a scheduled uh, completion date of uh, 2025, and one uh, in primary progressive MS uh, with ocrelizumab, the, the um, drug that's approved in PPMS, uh, as its comparator, and the scheduled completion date of May 2028. So at this point, uh, what we would like to do is uh, present two cases, um, uh, hypothetical cases, um, based on the data and, and, and discuss them, uh, Dr. Borer and I, um, uh, and discuss how we might approach thinking about these cases in the context of the very limited knowledge that we have now about BTK inhibitors in the clinic um, and whether or not these uh, might be appropriate molecules to consider. Um, so the first case is Nicole. Um, Nicole is a 24-year-old uh, right-handed woman, previously well, uh, and she presents with a two-week history of increasing paresthesias, mild weakness in the left upper extremity and left uh, lower extremity, um, left-sided hyperreflexia, slightly slow finger tapping on that side, all of which suggesting a spinal cord uh, syndrome. Um, her MRI shows uh, of the brain, um, and the spinal cord shows multiple T2 uh, bright lesions, um, presumably in the spinal cord, including one uh, at C5, uh, which could be a culprit lesion, of course, for her clinical presentation, um, and at least eight brain lesions that look very typical for multiple sclerosis, one of which enhances um, and no black holes. Um, she had a spinal tap, uh, and it has oligoclonal bands, increased Ig synthesis, um, but otherwise normal, normal protein, normal glucose, uh, normal cell count. And so we'd like to ask you, uh, for Nicole, um, based on clinical trial data to date, do you think, uh, and assuming, let's say, assuming that the phase three studies are consistent with the phase two B, as they often are in relapsing MS, um, would Nicole be a candidate for a BTK inhibitor? So 60% of you said yes, 17% said no, and 23% said not sure. And I would say that we put in this case um, in order to get a, a range of answers, um, so we can discuss that. Um, so I will ask Dr. Baror what, what he thinks about this case. I, I think diagnostically Nicole has MS. She's early in her uh, clinical uh, relapsing expression of disease. Um, she has sensory and motor findings. She's got a moderate lesion burden and some activity on this scan during this presentation. And so one would think of her as having moderately active MS, um, certainly not MS that you would say is uh, on, on the most uh, sort of benign end of the spectrum to the extent that that exists, and, um, but at the same time not the most active MS. And um, I think that this individual with early MS would be a good candidate for a treatment that um, looks to be at least moderately effective, uh, if not more, against the relapsing biology and appears to be very well tolerated and overall safe, if, as you say, the profile that we are seeing in the phase two uh, studies is uh, manifest through the phase three program. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I would point out that the oligoclonal bands and the evidence of both gadolinium enhancing and non-enhancing lesions suggest that she's had the disease biologically for some time. We don't know. We almost never know, of course, how long um, they've had it biologically. Um, but she's been forming um, new lesions. Um, she does not have black holes. Those tend to form in older people. Um, we don't know uh, whether she has paramagnetic rim lesions, although um, in general those lesions are, are a subset of the black holes, so likely she's early enough in the disease that um, shutting down uh, the formation of new lesions um, uh, one would hope would lead to sort of a, 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 a durable remission and, and, and hopefully reduce the, the, the chance of progression down 
uh, down the line. So um, yeah, I think one could make a, a good argument that she's um, a, a candidate for uh, um, uh, aggressive treatment. I would say that the other thing is um, I mentioned the highly active disease uh, for talabrutinib, the highly active disease um, sub-analysis that was done in the phase 2B. Um, I believe she would have met that. She's a little bit on the edge um, because she has only one enhancing lesion uh, in the brain and, and her other is in the spinal cord. Um, but of course, we worry a lot about people making spinal cord lesions and, and want to make sure that, uh, particularly those who've had symptomatic cord lesions, um, reduce the chance that they would have future ones. And then the question uh, that was posed is whether one would consider recommending that she enroll in a clinical trial of BTK inhibition. And I think, um, in my mind, it would depend on the design of the trial. I, I liked, uh, you know, your description of the, the tolibrutinib trial that maintained the placebo phase uh, for the placebo-controlled comparison short. And uh, um, I think this person needs to be on an active therapy, and so I'd be reluctant to put her into a trial that has any uh, more extended placebo controlled arm, but as far as uh, being an individual who would be uh, an individual that likely will be informative in the context of a clinical trial and for whom a well-tolerated, generally safe medicine that is likely to have an effect based on what we know already, uh, I think uh, could be a good candidate for, for a BTK inhibitor trial. Yeah, I think um, the current phase three trials are com comparisons against um, teraflunamide, and one might not rush to put a 24-year-old woman on, on that, perhaps. Um, so and I don't know whether, whether the current um, relapsing clinical trials are ideal, but not necessarily because of the BTK side of those things. Um, and I was answering not restricted to the trials that are ongoing, but more generically. Yeah, exactly. no, I, I would agree um, very much. Okay, I think... Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the... Thank you, sir. I think I get to introduce you to Kenneth. So Kenneth is our uh, individual with MS who's a 55-year-old right-handed man. Uh, his MS was diagnosed at the age of 28. Uh, he had an optic neuritis. He had several relapses in his early 30s and was treated for a good number of years with interferon beta therapies. Um, understandably, he's uh, getting quite tired of injections. His MRI lesion burden is on the low side. Uh, he's had no new lesions in at least 10 years, and he has few, if any, black holes. He appears to have uh, some loss of tissue. Of course, one doesn't know exactly how long um, it has been developing, but there does seem to be perhaps an acceleration in uh, the last few years, including both brain and potentially spinal cord volume loss. And he has a low overall level of disability, but uh, there is clearly a complaint of slowly worsening gait. And he used to be a pretty active guy walking a couple of miles a day, and he's now uh, unable to, to complete uh, even half a mile without feeling like he needs to take a serious rest. So for the audience, in terms of treatment for Kenneth, based on the clinical trial data to date, would Kenneth, in your mind, be a candidate for BTK inhibition? Number one, yes. Number two, no. Number three, I'm not sure. As I recall, there was a slightly higher percentage in the 60% range of yes in the previous one, so a slightly lower yes here. Um, and those who lost the yes are more or less evenly distributed across the no versus I'm not sure. So, Danny, uh, I'll pose to you the same questions that you had posed to, to me which are, uh, first of all, uh, would you view this as an individual who would be a good candidate for BTK inhibition, assuming, again, that the clinical trial data ongoing uh, are replicated through phase three? Yeah, so I think this is, this is uh, a hard case, <laughs> um, and we designed it to be a hard case, and I think there's a, a fair bit we can talk about here. Um, certainly, the clinical trial, the phase two clinical trial to date do not include anybody like uh, Kenneth. Um, and so we don't have evidence, any positive evidence, in support of uh, giving uh, Kenneth a, a BTK inhibitor. Um, there are uh, our clinical trials. He's a, he's a patient with, with um, a history of relapsing MS, um, uh, uh, but, uh, and fairly typical relapsing MS, but he's been quiet for a long time. And we don't know whether that's due to the fact that he's been treated for a long time really effectively with an injectable therapy, 
um, or to the fact that his disease has spontaneously become less active, and that's a, always a hard thing to figure out. Um, uh, we do know that, his, um, that he's beginning to show signs of progression, so we're worried about that. Um, uh, we don't know if we stop the, the injectable therapy, if he would have uh, uh, new lesions and new, and new activity, which presumably BTK inhibitors uh, um, would, uh, would, would help him uh, block, block against that. Um, he did not have evidence of black holes on his MRI, um, and he had very few lesions in the brain. We didn't uh, have any data about the presence of expanding lesions or paramagnetic rim lesions, so we really don't have very much evidence that he has active in inflammation in the brain at all. We, we just don't know. Um, so we're kind of in a gray zone here. Um, and, uh, and, and this is the sort of person that we don't have good ther treatments for currently. Um, so he might be a very good person for a trial of non-relapsing secondary progressive MS, um, but we just simply don't know whether the, the cellular and molecular mechanisms that, that Amit uh, showed um, uh, in his talk are, are in play in this, in this individual. Um, so I, I'm not sure there's a right answer uh, for Kenneth. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree entirely. Um, but we could, we, could, we could change it up. Like, we could say, well, you know, Kenneth has the same clinical picture, but he's got 25 T2 lesions, and three or four of them are black holes. We haven't done advanced MRI in him, but um, uh, uh, he's got a little more than just a tiny bit of atrophy. How are you feeling now? Well, I'm, I'm more concerned. Um, he's actively getting worse clinically in, in ways that are affecting his life. And uh, as you say, that's, that represents a major unmet need. And uh, I think as a community, we're, we're hopeful and excited about the prospect that PTK inhibition may, may actually end up uh, being uh, rather important for this, uh, this profile of patients. So, again, would, would treat if, uh, if more now through phase three and would consider him for uh, the existing progressive non-relapsing trial. Trials, yeah. yeah. I think, I, I, I agree, I couldn't, you know, I don't think we could say more about the importance of studying patients like this in clinical trials and the fact that clinical trials are uh, available for patients like this is a, 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 a real uh, advance in our field, I would say. Yeah. Danny, I know you're going to do a key takeaway in just a moment, um, and then we'll, we'll have some questions uh, that have been coming in from the audience. I did want to ask you, you, you described very nicely the lay of the land in terms of, uh, uh, of the larger trial programs moving forward. I know that an area that's close to your heart, and you mentioned it uh, before, this notion of maybe achieving something that's more durable, uh, an area that we're very interested in as well. And um, can you comment on the prospect of high efficacy therapy followed by a BTK in terms of sort of serial combination? I, I think it's, it's um, I mean, it's a very attractive idea that, you know, we, we know that the CD20 uh, antibodies are extremely effective in shutting down disease in, 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 in the vast majority of our patients, and they can go from highly active to really quiet. And, you know, of course, we're, in our practice, we're really surprised when somebody who's been on a, a, a B cell a depleter um, uh, has a surveillance MRI and shows any any sign of activity. It's it's quite you know, Uncommon. it's a day for talking with your colleagues. Um, uh, the combination of BTK inhibitors and uh, CD20 antibodies is approved uh, in the context of lymphoma, um, ibrutinib and and rituximab uh, in particular. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, experience in, in, in the use of these two uh, kinds of approaches together. Um, and one can certainly imagine uh, after a period of sort of depletion, um, then long-term maintenance with an oral therapy, such as a BTK, should they prove effective in trials, would be an extremely attractive uh, option for, for our MS patients. They, um, you know, even the irreversible ones, uh, they're, they'll be off within a couple of weeks, whereas with CD20 therapies, it, the dosing is much, much uh, far, farther apart, and 
you know, of course, we all were very afraid at the beginning of the pandemic when patients with no B cells, although you've shown nicely that they have nice T cell responses <laughs> um, to the vaccine. So yes, I, I think this could be a, a great way forward. In fact, we are engaged at the NIH where I work uh, in a study of talibrutinib uh, using advanced 7 Tesla MRI where we're taking patients who have been stable on CD20 inhibitors and they can either continue or go on um, a talibrutinib and so we'll have some data um, uh, in that regard, hopefully. Cool, thank you. You want to give a, a brief takeaway for the audience before we launch into the question? Yeah, sure. So just the key takeaways are that the uh, BTK inhibitors represent a really interesting development in MS um, because of their um, uh, ability not only to modulate cells that we know are critical for the adaptive immune response um, and have been shown, that is B cells, and have been shown uh, through their depletion to significantly impact relapsing MS, um, but these uh, molecules can get into the brain uh, and impact uh, res you know, plasma, plasma blasts um, and B cells that may be long-term resident in the brain, as well as the brain's uh, innate immune cells, um, the microglia. Um, and we haven't really tried that in the past, um, yet we know that these are all cell types that are important in propagation of the disease. The early data so far suggests that these uh, molecules are well tolerated, um, there are uh, in three of them now in phase three studies. Um, and so uh, to me, this represents a really exciting um, development in the field. Um, uh, hopefully in, a, in the next year and two, we'll have more definitive uh, data and uh, we'll begin to see packages that you know, hopefully will allow uh, the use of BTK more widely uh, among our patients. Thanks, Danny. Um, I'm going to start by asking you a question, and I'll start with an, uh, the easy one. Okay. Um, in fact, I may integrate a couple of questions here that um, are similar. Uh, one question is asking about which factors would you be interested in that may distinguish one BTK inhibitor from the other? Um, and a corollary to that question, in a sense, is how might you select a BTK when there are several to choose from? Yeah, so I mean, the, the real answer to that is it's going to depend on the phase three studies. Um, you know, we're of course interested in, in the adverse events that emerge, um, tolerability issues, um, uh, and, and efficacy against clinical outcomes, which we don't have um, well-powered results uh, to date. So I think it's a little bit hypothetical at this point and premature to um, to, to answer uh, that question. Um, hopefully they will all be good um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and the options may, may um, and, and our patients will have options. Do I get to ask you one now? You certainly or? do. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting question. Do you, do you foresee BTK inhibitors will be used as as adjuvant therapy, or will they be used alone as a single DMC? So maybe the thought was in combination with one of our existing uh, therapies. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you, you addressed uh, a related question which has to do with combination that is serial in the context of MS as opposed to concurrent. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we'll obviously need to see through phase three the safety profiles of the BTKs to get a sense of what we might consider as add-on or combination therapies that are concurrent. Um, to me, the BTK inhibitors, even, even if they prove only moderately effective against relapsing biology, the traction is their capacity, as we hope, to penetrate the CNS for those that do and um, with a view that they will modulate the biology of non-relapsing progression. And, um, one of the areas that the field is going to be moving into will be looking at combination therapies that can target the different biologies in MS, and it would be, uh, I think, uh, important to try to think of those that are able to both shut down the peripherally driven disease, but also the CNS compartmentalized. Uh, it's going to be, I think, uh, largely a safety, a series of safety considerations as to which combination may, may uh, uh, emerge as best. I kind of like the serial one that, uh, that you uh, are pursuing. I like that very much, and I think that possibly, particularly in the context of anti-CD20, the, the sort of depletion, repletion paradigm that may be associated, at least in some individuals, with a uh, more durable remission, 
you may increase substantially the number of people who stay disease-free, including perhaps the, this propagation of relapsing into progressive biology with, uh, with a BTK uh, inhibition. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I might add to that that although we, we don't currently have treatments that are uh, clearly neuroprotective or, or remyelinating, re um, uh, in that sense, it, you know, um, we, we don't know whether modulation of chronic inflammation with a drug like a BTK inhibitor would help promote uh, endogenous repair, um, but, um, but, but certainly remyelination therapies are being trialed. Um, I sure hope that eventually um, one or several of them will prove efficacious and one could imagine um, uh, uh, co-treatment, um, not just with BTK inhibitors, but with other existing um, uh, therapies. Danny, a question here about um, uh, cardiac, cardiovascular side effects. Is that uh, something that you expect to be less of a concern with the newer generation inhibitors? Yeah, I think the selectivity uh, to BTK for the newer inhibitors that we've talked about today uh, suggests those will be less of a problem. Um, uh, you know, ibrutinib um, is well known for cardiac effects and, and thrombotic effects and uh, or ble bleeding related effects and, um, and that has not been seen yet in the phase two, thank goodness. I think a lot of us felt that those uh, medications would not be uh, good to give to our, our patients a different cost, uh, risk benefit ratio than, than, than cancer patients. Agree. Uh, I'll read one quick one for you because I think you're, you're probably very familiar with this one. The, the, uh, the verbrutinib phase three trials are fully enrolled. When yeah. do you uh, expect the tolibrutinib trials to be fully enrolled? Um, entirely. Uh, sure by date, but as soon as there are enough events to do a readout, um, indications suggest that by the end of this year there may be a readout. Um, uh, the evobrutinib uh, uh, readouts are likely to be, uh, or begin uh, in, in, toward the end of, of 2023, we should begin to have some data. Um, I think we, let's see, we have, uh, if we can do one quick last question and then we have audience response questions. Well, uh, if, if what we've seen to date uh, in the MS context uh, continues through the phase three, then I think that these will be viewed as, as uh, very well tolerated and hopefully uh, quite safe therapies. And so from the standpoint of impacting quality of life, uh, you know, there, there are people for whom taking any pills not that popular, but for many people I think a pill form uh, that is well tolerated and safe would be viewed as quite attractive. I, I would agree. Yeah. yeah, the dropouts have been low. All right, let's finish. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Amit. It's a Thank pleasure. You Thank you, Danny. With you. Thank you all. Have a fine evening. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TCY860. This activity is supported by educational grants from EMD Serono and Sanofi.